Make sure. Go. Are we live? We're working? Okay. Good evening, everybody. Friday night, March 20th, 2020. The year of the apocalypse. Just kidding. It's not really. Down here in Juneau, another Facebook Live. Talk about a couple things here just to get you up to speed on what's happening. I know there's lots of questions, so I'm going to try to answer them for you. If you're watching tonight while we're going for the next 15 to 20-ish minutes or so, depending on how it plays out, pop a few questions in. Some of the folks are watching here, and they'll tell me if we've got a couple questions. Some of them have come up already. Well, what I want to talk to you tonight, we're going to go a little bit different. I didn't put a whole bunch of stuff up on the board because things have been changing so quickly. I'm kind of getting away from the educational side for a minute where we talk about how certain things are working or, or the process. Like, I want to just give you some updates on where we are because things are morphing very, very quickly down here. And I'm sure you've kind of seen that with what's happening. So normally, and I'm kind of skipping ahead here, the current Alaska legislature timeline starts mid-January and goes till, by law, 90 days, mid-April. Now, we pretty much blow that off, the whole uh, follow the, the, what's up? They want to know why you were absent. Oh, following the statutes. Um... We don't get there, uh, and we usually go to closer to 120 days, the constitutional limit. So, um, right now, the goal seems to be to get out of here as soon as possible because of what's happening with the COVID-19, with the virus. So, it would appear that we may be out of here, uh, yeah, it could be inside of a week, uh, depending on what's happening. So, we might meet the 90-day timeline for a change. Uh, but that's kind of the timeline that we are working on, which is much different than, than normal. It also means that things like a lot of bills that have been introduced and whatnot are pretty much getting shoved to the side. They are still having meetings. They're still working on certain legislation in both the House and the Senate. So I don't know how far most of those will get based on timing. Everything that they're trying to get through is the budget in some form and fashion. There's a lot of different things that are flowing out right now. But uh, the reality is it's moving pretty doggone quick um, to get out of here, uh, mostly because of concerns for the virus. So... Uh, that being said, that way you're aware your legislature may not be here like it is normally for a long time. So there's that. I'm going to talk a little bit about the supplemental budget because that happened this last week. Um, I think there was a question already. Somebody had asked, so I'm going to skip in front of the camera for a second. Ah, got it. Uh, yeah, so um, I was in self-quarantine. <laughs> That's why I was gone this week. Wasn't planning on it. I was here last week. Um, and then, um, based on when they extended the 14-day travel, or the 14-day, uh, what do you call it, not travel, 14-day um, CDC guidance, um, we were flying back Sunday night, we were home for the weekend, had some a few things personal to take care of last weekend, and they got a note on Sunday at noon. So I was told, you're not welcome back in the building until that 14 days. So even though we were here the week before, and uh, basically I had to stay out until uh, Thursday. So last night we came back, because that was the end of the 14 days. And here I am. So that's where I was, uh, trying to follow that guidance. It's kind of weird, and it all morphed as we changed, but anyway, so be it. That, that's how it played out. That's where I was. So, um, supplemental budget. So that happened here uh, a couple days ago. Um, I missed that one. Here's how it played out, to give you the big picture. There was about $250 million of what was called headroom withdrawn from the Constitutional Budget Reserve available to be used for the supplemental budget. And the House passed a relatively clean version to us, which I talked about last week uh, on the last Facebook Live. And it was about just under $300 million, roughly, pretty clean from what the governor requested to the House to the Senate. Well, the Senate added a bunch of stuff back in, a bunch of negotiations happened, and I wasn't part of that. Like I said, I'm not on finance anymore. got kicked off that committee with everything else by leadership. So um, wasn't involved in all of that. But they added a bunch of stuff back in. And then with this COVID, uh, some things with, the, with uh, the virus and some other additions to it, the supplemental budget um, actually grew to about 360-ish million dollars. So um, $110 million over what was, uh, you know, the headroom that was available to be pulled. So they needed to get more money. So the Senate passed it and voted for it. Um, several of us were gone for different reasons. Um, I already said why I wasn't here for it. And that extra $110 million, as I went line by line uh, a little over a week ago when I was here, the pre previous week with some folks from the governor's office, and there were some things that were veto addbacks. There's a couple, not too many, but there was maybe three or four. Round 10 on the vetoes overrides again. 
There were some things in there that I didn't believe needed to be in there that should have been in the regular operating budget. That's the way I looked at it because they weren't considered to be emergency spending. And there were some things that we need to pay for. And I've given that brief before about why we you know, often need a supplemental budget. Usually it's pretty small. But even the earthquakes, the fire with the big fire season last year, and Medicaid, even if you add those three up, that would have been roughly about that $250 million. Personally, I would have been good with that. Um, let it go. I could have added a little bit for the COVID response because we are spinning up and doing some things, and that's something unseen. Again, why you have a supplemental budget? You don't know that your car is going to break, and you got to take some money out of savings. Um, but 110 million dollars over. Sorry, folks, that was that was way beyond it for me. I, I would not uh, have been able to support that had I even been here for it um, because of that. And I don't take that saying that lightly. Everybody has to vote the way they think is best. I just would have preferred to see a much cleaner budget. We had a lot more into it. And I think it was more than, than um, I would have been able to stand had I been here and been able to be a part of that discussion and, and why it happened the way it did. So but that's an overall thing with our budget as we move on to this beyond the supplemental budget. It did pass. The House did not uh, give the House, a certain number of House members did not support the draw to fund the budget fully. So it's not completely done yet. We'll have to see where that ends up falling on this whole thing. So it's not all the way done. If we get into operating capital budget, I think they're going to be somewhat combined this year because of this timeline I already talked about trying to get out of here quickly. Um, but let's just get down to the brass tacks on it. Um, saw some numbers today. Won't put them up until we get a little further into the conversation, maybe sometime next week and do the next live on this. The operating capital budget of this state has gone up dramatically. Now, the capital budget before went up really, really high years ago, and I'm going back to the spending curve and we nearly doubled the size of our government, but the population didn't double. So as we talk about that, and we go into this explanation, what you see is a rapid expansion of the size of our government, and then, of course, the cost of the government. And PERS and TERS, the retirement things, union contracts, public employee unions, et cetera, all these things that get locked in inflation, make it grow at a rate that then we have to deal with that cost increase. And it's, you just basically can't get rid of it for some time. So because of all of those things combined, the operating budget has gone up and is going to continue to go up. So when you look at where it sits right now, um, we're somewhere around $4.5 billion. Okay, and that's without the dividend because some people want to include the dividend as a government cost. I don't agree with that, but that's the thought process of, amongst a lot of people here in Juneau in the legislature. So you got a big operating budget, and the capital budget will be some part of that. But remember when we had that big spike years ago, the operating budget went up, capital budget went way up. We cut to the bone, according to a lot of people, but most of that cut, oops, I erased part of it, most of that cut was the capital budget, not operating, okay? Capital budget can be turned on and off every year, as I go over that again, because it's just writing checks to build bridges and roads and maintain things, etc. But, operating budget, you can't get rid of so easy, okay? Because we saw that last year when we tried to do cuts to certain programs. So, without going over all of that again, I think what you're going to see is, again, they're going to try to say that the operating budget's flat this year, but the reality is we've got increases to the budget, and it depends on how you look at it. If you say that the, that the dividend is not in it right now, you could almost say it was less, right? Um, so it's sometimes a shell game. The words that are used, you have to be very careful about listening to what a politician tells you about the fact that the government were saving money or not spending money, because the reality is it pretty much goes up every year. And remember what I told you before, somewhere between 100 to $200 million, I'm just calling it 150 to be in the middle right now, roughly, of planned increases, regardless of what we do, just based on all those other factors we talked about before. So it's going to go up. There's no doubt about it. And what's missing out of this conversation? Frustrating part to me. Two things that I've said before, um, when I look at that curve, if I draw it this way, then maybe I'll see that. But you have the spending cap that's like this. You have our spend of where we are now, right, and our revenue coming in, right? So the problem we've, we have, folks, is this right here. You know, what we're, where we're at, revenue is here, spending is here, you got this big gap in here, so-called, is we're, we're not even having a conversation anymore. It's just dead. I'm not hearing anybody hardly in this building, anywhere, talking about trying to reduce the cost of government at all. Last year, I was promised by multiple legislators that, don't worry, Mike, and I've said this before, we're going to reduce it via legislation. Well, I can hear the excuses already. Well, coronavirus, we just couldn't get there. Well, there's nothing you're going to be able to say about it now. It's pretty much dead in the water. But my point is, folks, is that as you look at the budget moving forward, we're going to circle down the PFD here in a minute. 
and what's happening on that curve, the problem is, is that the conversation of reducing the cost of government seems to be almost gone from Juneau. It's just accepting how are we going to pay for the increases moving forward. If that's become the conversation, it's going to be really hard for me to, pull, to support almost any budget because we've excluded a, a principal part of this that's critical. How we're going to try to reduce the cost of government, not just let it continue to grow and constrain. And in addition to that, as I have pointed out before, that spending curve that I had over here, we have this really, really wildly high spending curve, and we're not touching the one thing that's going to provide stability moving forward. You say you want to be open for business. You say we want to be good business partners. We want to diversify our economy. And we want to keep oil and gas here for a while, right, because they're pumping things out for us and still paying a good portion of our bills, nearly half. If you don't give businesses stability by capping how government can grow with a constitutional spending cap, tweaking the one we have and making it relevant, I don't see how you create that business environment, folks. And we're not doing either of those things. We're not talking about trying to reduce the cost of government. All we ever hear the buzzwords, downward pressure. Well, that doesn't work very well because like spring keeps going up and we're not constraining ourselves moving forward. And if we're going to do that, how do I support voting for budgets that are just going to internally go up? And then the discussion is already talking to all the taxes we're going to do to fill that gap. I might as well just take Wilbur and just shovel money out the window because there's nothing constraining us moving forward. I can't support that. That's not the way we need to be looking at this. We're not looking at the whole picture, only parts of it, and only the parts that people want to look at. And I'm sorry, but those of us that were replaced by leadership, when they abused their power of the binding caucus and kicked us out of our positions, guess what? The ones that got put into those chairmanships, the rest of them, they do not support this reduction of budget. That's the reality of it. So it's very frustrating because we're not even having the conversation about trying to reduce the budget at all or, or cap it moving forward. So it makes it hard to, uh, anyways, moving on. Get fired up on that one. So, talked about the timeline. Uh, let's go to the PFD. There's a lot of you asking the question of this one. So, what's going to happen to your PFD? Well, <laughs> conversations anywhere from zero to three thousand dollars, roughly the statute. You can be pretty confident it's not going to be three thousand. Uh, if I was a betting man, you could go to Vegas tomorrow, except for the travel restrictions on the coronavirus, and I wouldn't bet on two thousand um, dollars. I will be surprised at this point if we're able to pull off a PFD that's in the $1,000 ballpark, even though that's not what the statute says. Um, right now, based on numbers, and some of it is beyond our control, some of it are things like where we spent down the Constitutional Budget Reserve, they blew through the $14 billion over the last X number of years, um, spending has gone up, we're not trying to reduce spending, we're not capping our rate of growth yet, all those things in there, guess where we are? You look at the PFD, it's always been the, the low-hanging fruit. You take the PFD this year, you add coronavirus and what's happened to oil, which has dropped dramatically. You add the stock market, which has dropped dramatically. You add tourism, fishing, et cetera, that's going to hurt us coming through this whole thing. Oh, we must have had an earthquake on the table. Almost lost the phone there for a second. Not really. So what's left is we've lost a lot of revenue. So let's talk about PFD related to the permanent fund and to the value. Right now, the value, unrealized gains, remember, this is what Warren Buffett said many years ago. Somebody asked him if he lost in that last big recession, um, did you lose any money? He's like, no. And they're like, well, you lost billions of dollars. He's like, no, because he didn't sell anything. He waited for the market to come back up. He still had his money. So remember, when we say unrealized gains, we've gone from, we've lost eight or nine billion dollars of value to the permanent fund so far, when you look at everything in aggregate. However, that's because the stock market has tumbled from 30,000 to 20,000. That's expected. Everybody's taking pretty good hits. So, right now, that's where the fund is down quite a bit, but those are unrealized gains. If that comes back up, if the stock market recovers even you know, somewhat, that will come back up again. So that's one thing to consider. It's not like all is lost, okay? But that does mean the revenue we're gonna get from it, when the time comes, will be less. There's just no way around that. That's the numbers. The numbers, I'll be quite frank with you, I told you guys I'm not gonna pull any punches on you. They don't look real good for this year, and next year is gonna be even worse. And when you add the economic impact of what's happening in the virus here in a second, watching our time, it's going to be a tough one, folks. So I'm telling you right now, I'm tying PFD to this other thing here, the stimulus, because I'm, I'm even just, just using the letters. It's such an emotional thing, both in this building and across the state right now. What we need, and I've been asking questions, is we need cash in our economy now because people are losing their jobs. I've got calls about, like, the entertainment, the uh, fun center, and the, and the movie theaters up in Wasilla, and the ones down in Kenai. I laid off 100 people Thursday. I got the call directly from the guy that's running it and bar owners and business owners, it's just it's happening all over the state right now. Thousands of people out of work, losing their jobs. What are you going to do? How are you going to get to the you know 
still pay your bills and your rent and get your kids the stuff they need, pay, pay for food. I mean, this, this is not a good place right now where we're at. This is this is tough. So one of the things I would like to do in addition to everything else that's happening, and people are looking at different options, is the stimulus package, right? To, but as I've said before, one of the things that's a stimulus package to me is the PFD. Put that thing out right now. We already had a vehicle that the governor, to his credit, filed back in January for what was called the payback of the, the full PFD for this fiscal year, which would have been about $3,000. We only paid $1,600. The governor talked about it today. I started talking about it last week. Let's get that other $1,300 or so dollars and just freaking put it out there. Vote on it. Get it moving so it's in people's hands. That's the better part of a billion dollars of cash in the economy that people need to survive. A family of four, almost $6,000 to help you get through the next couple months. Now add that to the other things the state's doing. The governor's got a billion dollar stimulus package coming with stuff for businesses and other folks, unemployment insurance, etc. To the things coming from the federal government, that hopefully will be enough for people to get by with this. But even then, it's still going to be tough on business owners enough because if they can't operate, we're, that makes it tough. So we need this in the economy right now. And it's not about the freaking PFD. So you keep talking about the PFD to stop. It's about getting money in the economy. Cash needs to be in the economy so we can keep this thing from flatlining on us. Because if our economy flatlines on us, we're in even bigger trouble. The virus is one thing, but you add the economic impact, we're in real trouble. We're orders of magnitude worse than anything the virus is going to do to us. This really does become, it's about the economy, stupid. It's one of those campaign slogans back in 1992, for those that might remember that presidential campaign. So I believe we need that 1300 or so dollars in the economy right now and push that thing out. Okay, now here's the downside, a couple numbers, and I said this is, we're going to run a little bit long here, but there's a lot to talk about, and we'll try to answer some questions, is that you have all these competing factors. So anything we take from the permanent fund now, the earnings reserve, if we have an extra draw, will hurt us moving forward. I acknowledge that. I'm not so worried about next year in the PFD right now, folks. I'm not even that worried about it in October. I'm worried about what happens over the next weeks and months to get people through this hump of what's happening with the virus and all that negative impact on our economy for all the things that are happening. I'm worried about the now. So I prefer to draw some money out now if we have to, even if it's an overdraw, and take the hit that's going to affect us later this fall and affect us next year so the economy and people don't flatline, lose their jobs, all the economic impacts we have from that, people leaving the state, and even crime. Crime's going to spike from this. We're already starting to see some of it. It will happen because people get desperate and they don't have a job and they want to feed their families. and they, Those things spiral, all combined together. This, this is a lot of negative things that come together. So... I'd like to see that get out ASAP. I think that's the right thing to do. And I'm going to give you my analogy to it. So let's just use permanent fund numbers, but drop off zeros. You got $60,000 roughly in your bank account. Your car breaks, right? And it's going to cost you three or $4,000 to go, well, that sucks. I don't want to spend money out of my savings account, but you need your car to live. It's what gets you to work. It's what gets your kids to school. It buys things that you need for groceries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's how you move around and get things done. So you suck it up, and you take a little bit of money out of your savings, and you fix your car so you can keep doing the things that you need to do. The Alaska economy has roughly $60 billion in our savings account. This is not money from the federal government that we're going to print out of thin air. It's not going to add to the national debt, which is already a huge threat to all of us. We're not borrowing money from anybody. We can take money out of our savings account, that $60,000, and spend a couple thousand of it, in this case a couple billion, and we can try to pump our economy up and keep it moving. That's why I think we need to do that and accept the fact that it's going to hurt us a little bit later on this year and perhaps the year after that. It just means less revenue as we move forward. It means you're going to get slightly smaller you know, earnings as the years, you know, the next year or years go on. But the reality, folks, is we've got to get through this one right now. That's why this matters to me. Okay, Big deal. So there's more to do with that stimulus package overall and how this is going to affect us and then what it does to your PFD because I'll be quite frank, folks, with what's happening with all those things I just mentioned and the fact that the PFD is going to be smaller, the fact that we may have to put money out of our savings account now to get there, the, the people, the way they're talking in this building is that you're looking at a small PFD later this year, if any a PFD at all, and then maybe not even one moving forward. I'm telling you flat out, you need to hear that because the economic picture for a lot of people is the government comes first and the PFD is whatever's left over. And as we get into the competing facets of how we're going to do this, um, there is a raging debate coming our way. 
and it's not going to be an easy year. I wish this was my last year and I could be gone because you think this has been bad? You wait and see what happens after the economic output and what lack of revenue we had and get into the next year, and you just watch. This is going to be a tough, tough battle, folks, with where we are, and I honestly don't have a good answer for you. I'm going to have to wait and see on this one. I really don't know. But I will promise you there are people from going statutory PFD until we change it, and I've said that many times. If we change a law to make the math work, I'm happy to do that, but I'm not going to support just willy-nilly picking something until we're willing to change the law so that we follow it. Um, and then whatever happens, happens. So just stand by, folks. So this is going to be a tough one. Had questions? Well, some of them will go back to the supplemental, though. Like cool. the reverse sweep, they want you to explain it. And can you discuss the insertion of it into the supplemental? The, what was the last part? Can you explain why they inserted it into the supplemental? Why ah, well, we shouldn't have done that. Okay, so let's talk reverse sweep broadly without getting into specifics. Every year, they sweep money out of various accounts and that money is swept, and then at the end of the fiscal year, as, as the next one begins, that money is put back into those accounts. It gets rather complex in how they did it for how the law is written, but basically it's a sweep of funds, and they go right back in again to the various accounts that they came from. There's a lot of folks think that we can take some of those accounts and not do that because it's almost becoming dedicated funds, which is against our Constitution. There's some grounds for that. Um, but this reverse sweep has been around for a long time, and it's also something that takes a lot of unraveling with accountants, and we're not nearly prepared to do that right now, looking at the battles and listening to the discussion. So the reality is it's off the table for doing anything right now. And this year, everything just shot to, pardon my French, but hell in a handbasket. We're just, it's, it's chaotic right now. But there's a lot of validity to having the conversation about the reverse sweep and pulling things out of it and trying to make this better and tighter if we even do it at all depending on the number of legislators we have who wants to do what. So it's a sweep of money out of various accounts in, and then right back out again to put it back in those accounts. As silly as that is, we won't get into the complexities of it. Like I said, it gets too much to talk to in a, in a short, shorter Facebook Live. Okay, but that being said, that went into the end of the question, which was about the supplemental. So that part, why was it put into the supplemental? I don't know, <laughs> because many of us argued, don't put it in the supplemental. Normally, all that supplemental is, is you find those budgetary items that you couldn't account for, and you just get some money in there so we can pay the bills that we spent more money on things than we saw coming. That's all a supplemental is supposed to be. This year, it's become very political. They put the reverse sweep in there with a three-quarter vote for the draw, and they added a bunch of money back in, and it just got to be a political mess. And as a matter of fact, even the COVID-19 money, they had to pull that out and put that in the mental health budget we passed last week just so they could get it passed and get that money out there to to do the COVID-19 initial response for the state. So I, I don't agree with the reverse sweep being in there. Normally it's in the operating budget. We debate, we have it out, and it's all one big package, including the dividend. And even now they're talking about you know, no dividend in the current uh, conversation of the operating budget. Some of us are going, ah. They're like, don't worry, we'll do that later. I'm like, mm, not sure I trust that one. We pass an operating capital budget without a PFD. I don't think you're going to get a PFD. I think till conveniently we won't be able to come back and take that one up. So I'm not sure I trust, I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure I trust that that thought process, quite frankly, with where we sit right now. Other questions while we're moving. Um, what will the PFD look like? What you're talking about is July 1st going to be the first distribution. Ah, <laughs> well, don't know yet. Um, I would like to see the stimulus package of this money already come out, like right now, and we could have this out in very short order if we would actually do it, so that would be good. Whether or not this legislature is going to do that with all of the disagreements, I don't know. So beyond the fact that we could put something out very quickly, um, I don't know how fast we will do anything, if we can even do that at all. I've even heard some people, which I can guarantee you, they'll try to say that this stimulus package, if we do this, is not. Um, and I'm trying to separate it from the PFD because I really don't care about that right now. What I care about is getting, like I said, cash in the economy. But if you tie it to the PFD, they'll say, well, that's the payback for this year. Nobody wants to do the payback to make it whole for the fiscal year to here. And go, oh, good Lord, here we go with this whole thing. So uh, this this debate is ongoing, folks, which is why I said there's a lot to talk about, but I don't have solid answers yet because we haven't. We're combining and crushing this all together at the end here very, very quickly. And it's also hard because I'm going to tell you right now, back to staff stuff and this quarantine and throwing people all over the place, um, I have no staff. I'm staffless right now <laughs> because my senior staffer is uh, – He's 68, and he had a former heart condition, and he's high risk, and he was scared to death of, if this pops, so sent home so he could isolate himself. And then my other one had to go um, down to Oregon to do some medical tests last week, and so now he's stuck down there because they said if he comes back, he can't come in the building for two weeks. So you're like, good grief. So um, it makes it a lot of fun when we're doing through the budgetary items and stuff to try to do this on your own. It's really challenging. So 
Uh, I don't. I hope I answered the question. But can legislate can legislatures forbid all rent mortgages and bills for Alaskans during this difficult time? I don't know what the governor can do legally to do that without a challenge. I mean, I, I know those questions are being asked and, and looked through the legal system. Um, what they are trying to do is a stimulus package, like for unemployment insurance, small business loans, getting businesses to be recompensated if they're able to continue to pay their employees, et cetera, et cetera. Much of what many people are doing is government programs, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not really opposed to that if it makes sense to help people because they certainly need the help. Unemployment insurance, they need quick access to these things. Small businesses are just trying to stay alive right now. So we need to be helping them because we kind of shot ourselves in the foot. Step one, we should have kept people out of the state. We should have uh, quarantined, if you will, our, our entry points, but we didn't. We're late on that one. And now we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot by shutting businesses down because everybody's panicking. So I'm kind of getting into the virus stuff here, but I skipped ahead a bit. But um, uh, I don't know that we have the authority to force people to do that, um, but it's into constitutional grounds and the Declaration of Martial, martial Law. We're kind of in territory that we haven't really seen before, so it's hard to answer some of those questions because many of these things might happen and then be challenged later in the court of law, but it's not going to happen in the short term. So I don't really know the answer to that, and I'm not sure anybody really does. Next question. Um, will we face a depression or just a recession? Good question. Recession or depression? It's hard to tell based on the actual numbers when you get into economics 101. I'm not an economist by trade, so um, I could get some of this wrong. But the recession versus a depression is how many quarters you go with negative growth and all those things kind of tied into it. If Ed King or somebody's watching, he can certainly correct me. Or Bruce Tangerman. Bruce Tangerman, somebody, excuse me. But I'm hoping that this is a recession. If we do it right and we have a quick blip on the virus and it is able to stabilize out fast enough, like it's happened in a few of the other countries, and it burns through quickly, then... Hopefully, we will be able to recover fast, get tourists coming back up. Uh, we can get business moving again, and we don't have a big uh, blip on this. If this goes more than you know, four to six weeks, this could start pushing us because of the economic depression across or recession across the state. And especially if oil price doesn't recover quickly, if the stock market doesn't recover quickly, then we're going to see more quarters of this are probably going to affect us. And it is likely that we're going to look at a lot more negative um, effects on the economy, certainly than the timeline of the virus itself. So it is possible, but I, I don't know. We don't know how long this is going to last. If it's faster and we recover quicker, quicker and do it right. I mean, right now, for example, we ought to be out there telling people, look, in, in two months, you know, the virus is going to be over. Come on back to Alaska. Everything's going to be fine. We should be sending that message out and hopefully people won't cancel all their trips and the cruises will start up again in May and everything's good. Keep my fingers crossed. But Anytime you do this, realize like if a business folds because it couldn't make it through this two to four weeks time frame, that business may not come back. And those people couldn't get jobs somewhere else because those other businesses are down. So this cascades, and that's the problem with that panic. When we hit, as we're talking virus stuff here, you get people into that panic mode, and everybody sees the one wolf in the cliff, and the whole herd goes, whoop, and off the cliff they go. And that's kind of partially what happened to us right now, and that's what we don't want to do. So I, I would prefer us to kind of put a wall of separation between Alaska and everybody else and limit who's coming in right now, and then let everybody else go ahead and go back to work and do the things that they need to do um, as the virus burns its way through our population. The point was is you want to have a slow burn so that it doesn't overwhelm the medical system. I've heard estimates from CDC as high as 70% of people are going to get this virus at some point. It's just you don't want it to happen all at once. You don't want a big peak, right? So that seems to be the biggest part of it. You know, we're doing what we're doing now. It's into mitigation. That's the best we can do. Um, and people are pretty aware of social distancing as we're just into the virus stuff now. Do all the normal precautions. Wash your hands. Wear a mask if you need to. Be just common sense stuff. You know, there's no reason to panic still. There's no reason, unless you are older, if you have underlying health conditions, then absolutely isolate yourself. Do what you need to do. Have family or friends bring you the things that you need. Don't go out into the population around Costco or the grocery store or anything else. But for the average population, folks, remember what we're seeing so far, unless the data is changing or they've completely suppressed it, most people are going to be fine. There is no real need to panic on this one, and most people are at best are going to have mild symptoms, right? So um, just, I give the same thing I said weeks ago, is just be as prepared as you can be, common sense on this one, stay calm, and, you know, I still advocate, I'd like to see businesses stay open. I, I, I can't drive the mandates, I don't have that kind of authority, but... 
Um, there are businesses that were calling and asking, can I stay open? And I was like, I sure hope you do because I don't want to see things fold. But at the same time, I've got stories of, uh, you know, directors going to businesses and tell them if they open, if they have a liquor license, they're going to come revoke their license. And it's going to be real hard for somebody to, to survive and have a business. So we are in some very conflicting times here to try to make this work. Uh, next question. Okay, so on to the virus stuff here. Talked about travel, some updates on what's happening just to get you up to speed on that. The travel right now um, has been updated as a mandate from the governor's office. And basically they're saying don't travel outside the state unless it's basically almost an emergency. Stay here and, and do what you need to do. There have been, as of tonight, you may or may not have heard, the shelter in place, I believe, was now launched by the Anchorage mayor, wanting people to just lock down. It's happening in a few states. I know California, and there's a couple others. I think New York did it as well. Uh, there's four or five states that have done it that are basically locking everything down for a couple weeks and just try to let the virus burn out that way. It's choices. People make a choice. So I would highly recommend, though, right now, unless you absolutely have to, don't travel outside the state of Alaska. Um, and I believe we should be instituting something that we should have done weeks ago, which is people coming into the state need to be screened. Thermally checked, and this is what I saw in Asia, it's been happening since the original SAR virus and the rest of it, you know, years and years ago. They do it every day. Come in, you get thermally scanned. If you look good, you can move on. If you pop on the thermal scan, yeah, you then go get pulled to the side and, and tested further screen. And then get a 14-day questionnaire. Where have you been? Make sure we get everything going. I think these are things we need to be doing on people coming in to the state so that we isolate and either quarantine or force a self-quarantine of those people coming in because that's where most of it came from. Uh, if we had done this initially, it could have really slowed down, I think, the, the introduction of the virus into the state, but we didn't do that. So, um, you know, like I said, this is lesson learned. These are kind of interesting times and things we haven't seen before. So I would be highly um, careful about travel out of the state, and then there's hot zones going through Seattle and other places anyways. Uh, watch that. As far as I know, so far, no travel restric restrictions inside the state, intrastate, that I'm aware of or that I hear that are coming down the pike. I don't think that's going to happen. It could, but I don't think so. Um, and just be careful. Again, traveling and get around big groups and stuff, CDC guidance, not more than 10 people, social distancing, all that kind of stuff. Um, but just be careful of your travel stuff, obviously, uh, especially just because you might you don't want to get stuck somewhere uh, if you leave the state. Logistics, same as before, no changes, folks. Just be prepared. Please, please, please do not panic buy anymore. You see pictures of, like, Grandma with her cart running through the store, and there's nothing there for her to get, and her cart is empty. Why? Because somebody went and bought 50 cases of hand sanitizer and 10 cases of toilet paper. And that will last you for the next freaking five years. What I'm asking you to do is please go get what you need. Give yourself enough to go out, you know, four weeks or something, get a, two cases of toilet paper instead of ten. And I know not everybody's doing it, but some people are. And the problem we run into, folks, logistically, is that the logistics system is not set up for that. It is not set up for every family to go buy ten cases of toilet paper. It's not. That's not. They base what we bring up on the ships on the normal usage of things. And it takes a long time for that logistics system to catch up. So if you take 10 cases of toilet paper, there's nine other families that can't. Um, and that's my point is, please, I'm asking you just, this is back to the whole thing. Don't hit the panic button. You don't need to. Get what you need. Try to be prepared for four weeks out, six weeks out, whatever makes sense. And then leave stuff for other people. And this, is a, this, is, this isn't a Republican or a Democrat disease here or an undeclared or anything else. This is, a you know, everybody. So this virus. So... Help each other out. Um, if, if you have a lot of stuff and you know people are hurting, reach out to your community. See if there's other people that need toilet paper. See if they need hand sun, sanitizer, food. Call you know your uh, elderly folks that may be stuck at home or they're trying to isolate themselves or people you know that have health issues. Give them a call. What can I bring you? Because you can drop stuff off on the door and you can stay isolated from them and help them out if they're in the high-risk category. There's a lot of things we need to be doing and can be doing. Not only does it take the burden off the state, but it helps us out in the community. This is a time for us to come together and help each other right now for all these things. But that logistic tail is still there, and that's an important point I want to throw out. I know this was a long update, folks, but there, like I said, we could talk for hours on these topics. So far, pretty much everybody on the logistics side of the equation has said they're still moving. Seattle's not shut down. Airplanes are still bringing stuff up. So we're still getting the supplies. The problem you have is that hump, as I talked about in the minute, woo, about to lose that. <clears throat> if you look in the supply chain, here's your normal supply line. Remember what I said about that before? And if all of a sudden everybody goes out and panic buys and the, and the spike of, of supplies is now this, well, that happens to your supply. Now you've got this big hole. And it takes this much time. How much is that? Three days, four days, two weeks? 
for that supply chain to catch up, and that's one of our problems being on the long end of the logistics tail in Alaska, which is why I implore you, please do not panic buy um, out of this. Get what you need and then share with others, okay? Um, outside of that, I mean, we've got, what, 14 cases, I think, confirmed. That's why I delayed a bit so that the governor could uh, get the latest data out. Lots of mandates. I put those on Facebook so you could see them in one place. Um, but that's, that's what's going on, folks, kind of through all this stuff here. Uh, lots happening and lots of things changing. We may do a Facebook Live in the next day or two, a little bit more often to kind of keep you up to speed because I could probably do one every day for 15, 10 minutes just to update you on how fast things are moving. Got another question? Just last question. Do you think the session is going to end soon? Yes, I do. Um, like I said, normally it's the better part of four months, but the... As much as I say don't hit the panic button, it would seem that the legislative body has hit the panic button. And now they really, really, really want out of here as fast as possible. That's kind of what I hear is a consistent theme here. Um, so I believe so. Um, but, I'll throw a but here. I think what may happen is a quick end to get out of here now. And we may see some kind of strange six, nine-month budget that gets us out of here for a while, sees where things sit with the virus and the economy, reassess the numbers, and come back. I'm not necessarily opposed to that. That might be a wise plan right now because, really, we're trying to prepare a budget knowing that this year is going to be a very unique and very bad year for us. It may be wise to get out of here for six months and then come back and try to reassess what we need to get for the rest of the year. I, these are just ideas. I don't know that that's a fact. But we probably are going to leave here within a week-ish is kind of the words I keep hearing thrown around here. So I don't think we'll be here that long. But that being said, as that caveat, I'm also not sure that means we're done for the year. And that may not be, again, a bad thing because we just don't know the results of the virus, the results of the economic impacts. We don't have enough information. This could end up being, I think the governor used the word yesterday, a nothing burger. Maybe in the end it is pretty calm and we should have never panicked. Probably been the right answer. And everything is okay. At the same time, it could go south, especially with the economy, and, and we're really reeling, and we're going to have to redo the numbers and figure out where we are. I don't know. A lot to that. Other questions throughout it? Last one, because of time, I want to throw this out because I think I'm going to lose my platform to be able to talk about the Binding Caucus, but I, and I don't want to spend a lot of time because that's not the biggest issue right now. There's much more important things. That's about stimulus package and people getting the virus and how we're going to get through this economically. But I want to throw things out because, again, we're getting questions, and I'm going to keep talking about this, and we'll go more. But some of the specific questions that came out last week, just kind of where we are with the research on this. I'm doing a project and reaching across the country. We have reached out now to all other, all of the other 49 states. So I have a feeler out across the entire country on where the Binding Caucus is this way so I can be seen. Was I pulling a Wilson there at the top? <clears throat> so right now, um, without more detail, you'll, we'll do an entire segment on this as we get to it. Um, because like I said, I don't think we're going to get a hearing on it. Is that... I'm to 27 legislators, I have talked, senators, other state senators across the country, 27 out of, of the 50 total, you know, don't include Alaska. Not one, folks, not one, zero other states use a binding caucus. And most of the comments I have gotten have been something to the effect of this. What are you, a banana republic? The guy in Nebraska said, you'd go to hell for that here. His quote. Um... There was one in Mississippi that said something to the effect of, he's like, I couldn't be a part of that. That's crazy. Uh, and actually read me their oath. You know, this in Mississippi, it's fascinating. The last two sentences of the oath of office for a legislator in Mississippi says that you can't promise your vote. That's essentially what it says. There is no binding there because you can't promise to vote for or against any person for this. That. I'm like, wow, impressive. And I already told you before, Colorado says it's unconstitutional through their Supreme Court. So I just wanted to give you an update on that. Okay, so enough there. We'll talk about that later. Folks, it's Friday night. Um, and what I would ask you is pay attention to what's happening. Um, we will do another update in the next couple days. If emergency something pops up about travel, I might pop on Facebook Live for a couple, two, three minutes. So here's the latest that's going on. At a minimum, I will try to stay, keep posting the things that are happening so that you're aware of it because I know not all of you are watching TV all day or accessing other things, so I'll try to continue to be an information source for you. Um, all I would ask at this time is don't panic. Stay safe. Um, take normal precautions. The bottom line is, you know, we've got some good first world problems here. We have $60 billion to draw on. Uh, we can make this work, and we will, but it's gonna, there's going to be some pain involved in the, in the meantime. Um, so keep an eye on your legislature. I'll tell you what's happening. And because this has been a really long update, I'm, I'm kind of struggling to just say goodnight. So I'm just going to say goodnight. We will talk to you guys soon. Pay attention. We'll probably do more very soon. Take care.